inclusively exclusive. A conversation like this probably goes on more often than we realize. Perhaps between two individuals who have known each other for a while and are just venturing into the vulnerable topic of religion and spirituality. Or maybe it may occur between a couple of strangers who are on an airplane. Have you ever considered the claims of Jesus Christ? One may begin. And the other replies, there is no need. All religions are the same. No one can claim that one religion is right and another is wrong. One can believe whatever they wish as long as they believe it sincerely. All religions can be equally true. Now, I imagine that you've heard of conversations that take place similar to this. Maybe you've actually been in a conversation of this type of, of back and forth. Complementing conversations of this nature, we are also aware that there is a plurality of mindset in the spiritual world. Many of you have seen, I imagine all of us have seen a bumper sticker, coexist. And the appeal is that people of varied religious persuasions and convictions would be able to live together in peace. And as it is intended in that manner, I think it's a good thing. But if you look at the claims of the founders of these various world religions, it is actually impossible. Without going into a great deal of detail, those who are fundamental Islamic believers would never coexist with those of another faith. And there are claims that Jesus Christ makes that we are going to examine in just a few moments that preclude the validity of other belief structures. We live in a time in which we can believe anything and it seems to be culturally acceptable. But all religions being equally true is something akin to attaching jello with a nail upon a wall. <laughs> very, very tricky and really impossible. Come with me on a brief lesson in history as it relates to Western civilization and Western philosophy. When you look at the development of our cultural mindset, there have been significant changes that have taken place throughout the centuries. Maybe you've heard of the term modern, but before modern, there was pre-modern. And today, specifically, we live in an era that is known as post-modern. Pre-modern, modern, post-modern. Post what do these labels refer to? Generally speaking, as you're looking at the information provided upon the screen, pre-modernism takes us to a time in our history before 1500. And the prevailing mentality in society at that time, that there was objective, ultimate truth. We may not know what that truth is, but we believe that that truth was existent. There was a belief in the supernatural and that authority comes from a divine being. This was the mentality of culture predominantly in the pre-modern era. From about 1500 to 1950, shifts begin to occur which have been identified as the modern era. There is still the belief that there is objective, ultimate truth. But that truth does not reside in the supernatural realm, in the divine realm. 
Authority now come from science and reason. And this grew out of the Renaissance and the Reformation as it relates to science and reason, more so out of the Renaissance than the Reformation. And we touched on that briefly last week as well. About 1950, and that date is somewhat flexible. You can move that around. It could be 1940, 1930. But we're just going to label it as 1950. The postmodern era came upon the stage of human history. The objective is that truth is unknowable. There is no overarching truth. There's a fascination, though, with the mystical. And really, it results in no ultimate authority. As we continue to try and unpack this briefly, and we could spend hours doing this, in the pre-modern era, God is the source of truth and reality. In the modern era, science and reason become the source of truth and reality. God, religion, and morality are arbitrarily demoted to the subjective realm. In the postmodern era, there is no source for defining truth and reality beyond the individual. The postmodern era is characterized with relativism, individualism, plurality, and a selective tolerance. Key term there, selective tolerance. And so some have graphically displayed the differences between these three eras in this manner. Postmodern, a point. God put it there, and that's the way it's always been. Modern, it's not nailed down. It's progressing onwards and upwards with inevitable progress. And postmodern, it's just gibberish. <laughs> we cannot make sense out of it. So in the postmodern era, we find that it is full of inconsistencies and absurdities. It is a worldview that says no worldview exists. It is anti-theory, but it uses the tools of the theoretical to neutralize theories. It demands imposed uniformity in an effort to resist uniformity. And it employs propositional statements to negate propositional statements. An example of that is this statement on the next slide. All truth is relative. That's an absolute statement. But except this statement. Do you catch the irony there? It's a claim of an absolute truth which denies its own source. Whereas in the modern era, we were confident that we could find all the answers with the certainty of science and technological advancement that eroded with the occurrence of two world wars. Questions begin to come into the minds of many. A sense of hopelessness seeped in. Then in the postmodern era, questions and incapacity to know anything with certainty grew. Skepticism and a rejection of authority. Anxiety was the result. When it comes to spirituality, in the postmodern thinking, it affirms the nurturing of our spiritual being as vital to humankind. But with the loss of truth, it comes as faith without boundaries, faith without categories, faith without definition. The old parameters of belief do not exist. People will be increasingly open to knowing God, but on their own terms. And an example of that can be given to us from what we would think of being as historically pre-modern, but it was postmodern in its expression. The children of Israel gathered about the base of Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up on the mountain. They don't know what's happening to him. Anxiety begins to come into their psyche, and they appeal to Aaron, come, make us gods that will go before us. So in a sense, postmodernism is making God in our image rather than us 
being humble before his image. Have I lost you yet? Are you still thinking about this? Stay connected. Breathe deep. Give oxygen to that brain. Postmodernity is characterized with uncertainty, skepticism, relativism. There is no ultimate truth. Plurality. What's true for you is not true for me. This is all layered up on what we thought about last week as to the causes of the decline of belief historically. Now, there are some of you here today who were not here last week or the week prior, and you're wondering, where in the world is the pastor going with this? This is in the context of what we have been focusing on in this month in our series, Mind the Gap. And we're actually reacting to a video that was produced by a professor at Southern Adventist University revealing the results of a study that he did with those who are no longer active participating in the Seventh-day Adventist community. Over 700 respondents to his survey, 70% Roughly 70 to 75 percent were under the age of 45, and they are no longer involved in the Seventh day Adventist faith community. And he's asking, why is this? Why do we have people who are leaving the Seventh day Adventist faith community? There's a gap that is occurring between those who are inside the community of faith and those who are outside. And the number one reason, which was so startling and frightening, why did you leave? Respondents answered because of doctrinal disagreements. They no longer believe what the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches, which is a new day. That is a new era compared to decades ago. Decades ago, I would occasionally run into those who had left the church and the primary reason was always because of relational conflict. They still believed almost everything. But they had left because of a hurt that had been inflicted upon them by someone else. But today that is no longer the case. People leave also because of doctrinal disagreements. And the number one thing that the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches, which is at most at odds with those who have left, is our understanding as Seventh-day Adventists that we are not just any other church, but that we are an answer to the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation known as God's end-time remnant people. Fewer than half of those who have left no longer believe that. So what I invite you to think with me for a few moments about this morning is inclusively exclusive. Inclusively exclusive. Because one of the observations, one of the criticisms, the critiques that comes from those who are outside of the Seventh-day Adventist community, is that the Seventh-day Adventist community has this sense of, at times, we might even use the word arrogance, that we think that we are it. And if you're not on the inside of it, you are out there somewhere. I want you to look at some passages that we find describing Jesus and look at his model of inclusively exclusive. And that that can provide us clarity and confidence for today, next week, into the future as Seventh-day Adventist Christians in the place that we live in prophetic history. Look at some of these statements of Jesus that favor the exclusive aspect 
of who he was and what he said. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a claim that cannot exist in the coexist bumper sticker. In John chapter 3, verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. These are exclusive statements that Jesus makes. There are not multiple avenues to God. There is one avenue, Jesus says, it's through me. In his conversation with the woman at the well, John chapter 4, Jesus told her, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Is Jesus a bigot? Is he narrow-minded as he makes statements of exclusivity? Coexist cannot exist with Jesus' statements such as this. Now, we could get along with neighbors, but if we're looking for authentic connections of the divine, no, Jesus is exclusive. The Apostle Paul reflects on Jesus, and he makes this comment to Timothy, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man. One. Not a plurality. One. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. In the Gospel of John, we find seven I am statements. You can look at them briefly here. I'm not going to read all of those uh, listed. But I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true vine are examples of his I am statements. Seven I am statements. Oh, but no, there's not seven. There's eight. Because in John chapter 8, in his dialogue with the religious leaders at that time, he makes this statement. Before Abraham was, I am. And that is a direct reference back to Exodus chapter 3, around verse 14. Moses is at the burning bush, and he asks the divine voice and the divine appearance in this flame, well, who should I tell them when I go back to my people in Egypt? Who has sent me? And the voice says, I am that I am. Jesus uses bad grammar in John 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I have been, or I was, or I were. No, 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 no. Before Abraham was, I am, because it is an identification. I am the one who was, I am, at the bush. But no, there's not seven statements. There's not eight statements. There are nine statements. John chapter 18 and verse 4. The mob has come to the Garden of Gethsemane. And they are intent on arresting Jesus. Jesus has had his prayer as recorded in John 17. He's gone to the disciples for support. They are sleeping. But now the mob has come to take him. His hour as he has talked about in John, is beginning even now. And so he asks the mob, whom are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, I am he. And then the record goes on to state, now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. We're not given any more details other than that they drew back and they fell to the ground. The biography of Jesus, the desire of ages, offers this riveting insight. Jesus replied, I am he. As these words were spoken, the angel who had lately ministered to Jesus moved between him and the mob. Now that angel is recorded in Luke chapter 22. He came to give encouragement to Jesus at his hour of lowest emotional and spiritual challenge. A divine light illuminated the Savior's face and a dove-like form overshadowed him. 
in the presence of this divine glory, the murderous throng could not stand for a moment. They staggered back. Priests, elders, soldiers, and even Judas fell as dead men to the ground. The angel withdrew and the light faded away. Jesus had opportunity to escape, but he remained calm and self-possessed. As one glorified, he stood in the midst of that hardened band, now prostrate and helpless at his feet. The disciples looked on, silent with wonder and awe. I guess so. Can you see that in your mind's eye? <laughs> Glory manifested itself in front of that mob. Like Saul on the road to Damascus, they are laid out on the ground because of the manifestation of divinity, a heavenly visitation lit up. And it's like they get up, shake it off, and arrest him anyway. Absolutely incredible. We've looked at some of the exclusive aspects of Jesus. Now, what about some of the inclusive, the other side? of Jesus. Let's think for a moment about the spectrum of people and personalities that Jesus paid attention to. I have often referred to John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, Jesus' private personal conversation with Nicodemus, outstanding person in the whole country, member of the Sanhedrin, highly educated, wealthy, well-respected. And in the very next chapter, John chapter 4, we find that Jesus has a conversation of great significance with a woman whose name we don't even know. Broken relationships, and yet, Jesus gave her as much priority and attention as he had given to Nicodemus. Total opposite end of the social economic spectrum. In Matthew chapter 8, we read of the experience of a Roman centurion coming to Jesus, appealing for him to, to heal one of his employees. And Jesus says, I'll come. And the centurion says, you don't, you don't need to come. Just say the word. Just speak the word. And I know that my, my servant, my employee will be healed. And Jesus responds to that, assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's an inclusive statement. It's inclusive culturally that he is ministering to a Roman centurion. And then he makes a prophetic statement that in the kingdom of God, many are going to come from all points of the compass and sit down in the kingdom of heaven. That's inclusive. But the sons of the kingdom, Jesus went on to state, will be cast out into outer darkness. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells the story about that traveler going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he's accosted, he's robbed, he's injured by bandits. And the priest walks by, and the Levite walks by. But then he says, oh, there was a certain Samaritan. As he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion which of these three, questioner, do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? This was a radical story for Jesus to tell, making the Samaritan the hero. By the way, 
Do you think Jesus was conservative, liberal, or radical? Don't answer. Hint. All three, depending upon the situation. In Mark chapter 2, the question comes from the religious establishment. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Luke 15 the observation is provided. All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. So Jesus fraternizes with the riffraff of culture and society. Oh, but then, if invited, he goes to the home of a Pharisee. Now, as it turned out, he had some very challenging things to say to the Pharisee, but he accepted the invitation of the Pharisee regardless. These are all illustrated of the inclusive aspect of Jesus. He was not restrained by culture, by socioeconomic considerations. He was arms wide open, available to all. In Mark chapter 12, there's a little dialogue that we're going to look at in detail. Then one of the scribes came and asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus replied, the first of all the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment, replied Jesus. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so the scribe says to Jesus in reply to his answer, Well said, teacher, for you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. No, no postmodernism in that conversation. There is one God, no other but he. And then the questioner goes on, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all of the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And how does Jesus reply to this? You, my friend, are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, he was in that socioeconomic class, which as a group were opposed to Jesus all the time. But here's an individual, and Jesus is accessible and affirming. Oh, Jesus is very, very inclusive. Tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees and Roman centurions, scribes, women, men. But he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As his commission to his disciples, he proclaimed, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Here we have exclusivity and inclusiveness all in the same statement. All nations, go to everybody. Be a representative of my authority. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And I am going to be with you to the end of the age. Now, an example of this we can find in the ministry of Paul, Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens, and he's surveying the city. He comes to a gathering of the intelligentsia called the Areopagus, and he has a few things to say to them. I perceive that in all things you are very religious, you Athenians. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, I'm going to tell you, Athenians, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not dwell in temples made with hands. Truly, these times of ignorance, the God of heaven overlooked, but now commands, look at that word, he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Woohoo! When they heard this, the response is that some mocked while others said, hmm, we want to hear more. And some of them joined and believed. Now Paul made a reference to the resurrection and we looked at that last week. That the resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. If there was no resurrection, there is no future. There is no relevance in the ministry of Jesus. The resurrection is that act which validated everything that he claimed to be and that would happen. Some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. And some believed and joined inclusively exclusive inclusively exclusive are you tracking so this is the foundation where i now want to come back to the study that was conducted by professor alan parker that there are a number who have left the Adventist community because they don't believe the Adventist community is the remnant end time movement of God. Now this is in our beliefs. Belief number 13 states this. The universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ, but in these last days, a time of widespread apostasy, a remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour, proclaims salvation through Christ, and heralds the approach of his second advent. This proclamation is symbolized by the three angels of Revelation 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven and results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Every believer is called to have a personal part in this world wide witness. If you want to read this for yourself, just take a picture of the screen and go to the website there that is referenced. Seventh-day Adventists have an identity of being God's in-time people, bringing clarity to the times in which we live and to the future yet to be revealed. One of those indispensable foundational texts is Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Without going into a detailed study of this passage or the book of Revelation, we have come to believe, and not just us, but those who have preceded us by centuries, that the woman is a symbolic representation of God's people. And when we read here, the dragon went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. That is translated in the 1611 King James Version as the word remnant, from which our term arises. Remnant, people of God. Revelation 14, 6, these words are very familiar with most of us. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That's inclusive. The gospel to go to all, all people groups, all languages, all nations, saying with a loud voice, here's the exclusive part, fear God. And give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's the first angel's message. It is inclusive, but yet exclusive as well. 
The second angel proclaims, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And as a follow-up to that, in chapter 18, verse 4, the appeal is given, come out of her, my people. Exclusive. Babylon has fallen, but I have people who are in Babylon who need to come out. That's inclusive. In Revelation 14, that third angel, beginning at verse 9, if anyone worships the beast and his image, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God. And this warning is given because in the prior chapter, chapter 13, the beast mandates worship, and those who do not comply are threatened with death. But here is the patience of the saints. As the message goes out, worship him, the creator. As the message goes out, Babylon has fallen. As the warning goes out, do not worship the beast. Do not comply. Do not be fearful of those threats and persecution. Here is the patience of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. These are the identifying aspects and experiences of God's end time people. Now, with this reaffirmation of our role and our significance in this point in time, how do we then go about minding the gap? What gives us voice? What gives us presence? What gives us credibility? One, who is a director of ministry to postmoderns in the trans-European division of Seventh-day Adventists, has suggested three biblical principles for evangelizing postmoderns. One is to belong before believing. Now, typically, we've asked people to believe and then belong. But in the thinking of no absolutes, everything's subjective, all is relative, relationships are highly, highly valued. People are seeking honest and genuine relationships, he writes. Early on, Jesus invited potential followers, come and see. Just come and check me out. John chapter 1. Jesus was in a relationship with his 12 disciples for about a year before he actually called them, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. When we look at Mark 1, Luke 4, Matthew 4, it appears that just out of the blue, Jesus is walking by the shore of Galilee and he calls these guys to leave their nets and follow him and like they'd never met him before. Uh, no, 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 no. When you fill in the gaps from John's gospel, you'll discover that he had already had contact with them for at least a year and most likely even up to a year and a half. Belonging before believing, a sense of belonging places seekers in the position of Observer participants so that they can learn what the gospel is all about. They can observe at close quarters how it impacts lives. Through this process, the seeker comes to know when, when sh he or she is ready to make a personal decision. Belonging, welcoming, relational is the outreach avenue to postmoderns. Secondly, process, and these are somewhat related, process. The apostles spent more than three years growing up in understanding more and more about Jesus. First, he was simply a teacher, and then a prophet, and then the Messiah, and the Son of God. This clearly suggests that as the disciple apostles grew in their understanding, we need to give people space to grow in their understanding as well. Even though we are accustomed to instant food, instant drinks, instant cash, instant messages, we cannot do evangelism that way, at least not with this new generation. 
the postmodernists find it unacceptable to be approached with the truth in the form of a dogmatic grand scheme proposed in a point of time. They will reject it. And I'll confess to you, this is foreign to my logical thinking. I am very cerebral, very rationalistic. And it takes effort not to make dogmatic statements when I know they're true. <laughs> Thirdly, story. Personal stories. This is my story. This is my song. The new generation seeks to find a role model when they see Christians who live their stories out in a faithful community. They will then respond to that model. It will provide hope to a generation without hope. It will support them in their everyday life and nurture them in their spiritual growth. So these are three great avenues to going about evangelistic ministry in a post-modern context. Emphasize relationships, belonging. Give people space. Allow them to process. Live authentically. Not that you have to live perfectly. We are human and subject to making mistakes but we admit them when that occurs. We are genuine, transparent, authentic followers of Christ. Inclusively exclusive. I see that in the ministry of Jesus. I see that in the ministry of the apostles. It is the heart of God. God cannot deny himself to say there are other avenues to me. I am it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But I am so inclusive. Any who desire is welcome. Any who respond to my work upon their thinking and their emotions is welcome. Mind the gap. We need to mind the gap in our own interior experience as well as being sensitive to the gap that may be operating in those around us.